Claire has over 20 years experience in the tech industry. She has set up her own consultancy business two years ago, working with companies to help them on their innovative journey. She regularly speaks on topics relating to artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and innovation trends. Before setting up her own consultancy business, Claire was also a member of Microsoft Island leadership team. Oh, God, that took it out of me, that run. Uh, for over eight years, working with customers and partners on innovation pilots. She's a member of an industry expert group for Technology Island Innovation Forum. So we all welcome Claire. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, everyone. That was pretty impressive after a three lap of the room. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I'm not part of the learning community per se, though I do love learning, um, but I come from the technology industry. Uh, and I'm here today to maybe talk a little bit about my experiences of how important learning is in the context of this kind of digital transformation that we're all moving towards. So in my role in Microsoft when I was, when I was there, I was always involved in getting people to use the latest versions of technology. For about 14 years, this was working with developers on the very most technical of products. And I think one of the things that struck me in the last few years was really about how um, the whole industry has moved in the tech industry. It's moved and it's kind of had a realization that it's not all about the technology. Um, and for me, it was very clear that we were building some amazing stuff, like really, really interesting examples of innovation. But then they were getting stuck. People weren't using them. They did ever kind of got into the, into the organizations that they were meant for. And everyone's kind of sitting there going, why? And all these engineers are looking at me going, it's so perfect and beautiful and elegant. Why won't anyone use it? And you're kind of thinking, maybe there's more to this problem. But one of the things that I think has really kind of struck the tech industry is the pace of change. So of course, the tech industry itself has a huge amount of uh, change going on and a whole lot of learning requirements as a result of it. There's so much change, in fact, that people are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. Have you, got, you guys have all have heard that term, right? The fourth industrial revolution. I remember when I first heard it, I was like, there's been four already? I, like, I can remember one from my history books, but not really that there were four or three already. Um, and then when you start looking at them, you start thinking, okay, we have the mechanical steam engines, we have the, on the oncoming of electricity, we have computing. And you start looking at these industrial revolutions and thinking, but there were loads of other inventions. There was loads of other innovations that happened over the centuries. What has made these ones the things that we call revolutions? And it struck me that it's not about the actual technology at all. All of these revolutions were not about the technology. They were about the changes of work practices, the very significant changes of work practices that happened at the times when these technologies happened to come about. And sometimes there were more things that happened at the same time that helped that happen. But when we had things like the steam and electricity and computing, they all completely changed how we worked and then consequently how we lived. So when we think about the fourth industrial revolution, again, it's not one technology. And it's different in many respects. The first thing is that when we think about the innovation in the fourth industrial revolution, it's, it's actually spread across three areas. It's the physical world is dramatically changing. There's innovation happening all the time. Think about autonomous vehicles, think about robotics, think about whole new materials that never existed before, smart nanotechnologies, uh, and, and all the kind of responsive materials that are out there, 3D printing, all of this completely changing the world of manufacturing and how we create things in the world. You think about what's happening in the biological world, where we can literally decode the genome, where people can grow organs with your DNA in them. I was looking at telly last night, and they were featuring a company in the US who were growing chicken nuggets from chicken cells. They had no, fat, no animal husbandry at all. They had vegans trying them out, going, oh, I suppose if, I, if there's no animal cruelty, maybe I'll try these chicken nuggets. I'm pointing at Hannah because she shared that she was a vegan earlier. But, <laughs> but so the point is, this is the world that we're now living in. And think about what that would change and what that would mean for our whole society if you no longer have to breed animals in order to get meat. So these are the kinds of innovations and changes that we have to look forward to, which means huge amount of change in how we work and live. So everything is changing. And it's not just the innovation. Demographics are changing. We're all living longer. First time we've got five generations working simultaneously in the workforce, all earning and spending money differently. We've got pressures from both political change, and I won't mention the B word, that's local, but even global economic changes that are happening. We've got climate change having, making us change how we do everything, right? So everything is changing. And at the same time, when we think about what that means from a digital perspective, 
we kind of, and I loved hearing that, I love the way we started this session, by the way, to hear your definitions of what digital transformation means, because the truth is, it means different things to everyone, right? And it means different, it, 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 it is different in your personal context, depending on where you are personally, depending on what your organization is, depending on what your goals are for what transforming means to you. But fundamentally, if you have to classify it, and having seen this done before, I kind of think about it in, in kind of four different buckets when you think about where you might look for transforming or how you transform. There's a lot of stuff around how you engage your customers, what the customer experience is going to look like in the future. There's a lot of stuff around how we can work together, what are the processes and tools we use for better collaboration. There's a lot of stuff around external relationships, things like supply chains and partners and how we do that, how we, how we move things around the world, how we, how we extract value from supply chains that's all changing, and of course business models, um, because they're completely changing. Uh, I think about, from my own perspective, as I mentioned earlier in the tech industry, and you know, suddenly caring about how technology is used, you know, it'd be nice to think we're all suddenly come to this nirvana that it's important because we're all better people and actually care about the impact in the world, and that is what a lot of people do care about. But I think, fundamentally, one of the main reasons the tech industry is concerned about adoption of technology, even more so in the last little while, is the change from a product service, from a product industry to a services industry. So if any of you are following the tech world, and I came from Microsoft, there was a time when Microsoft would throw products over the wall to the, to the you know, unsuspecting users once every couple of years and go, well, you know, I mean, if you use it, go ahead, just as long as you sign that renewal agreement, we're all good here. But now they're being paid by the month. They're being paid by user by month. Now they really care if you're using it or not because they've moved to the services, software as a services industry. And the whole tech industry is moving towards this rental model and people are only paying for it if they're getting value from it. So now it becomes even more important for it not just to be technically brilliant, but for it to be usable. And so these things are all changing, all transforming. And if you look at maybe how they're transforming or what's happening, again, if you want to kind of book it, I kind of book it in three ways. One is that things are being automated. So particularly in terms of if you want efficiencies. And there was a discussion earlier about whether, you know, making efficiencies or making things faster is really transformation. But I think that depends on your scale and your context. Because sometimes if something would have taken a whole hour or a day, and now suddenly you can do it in a couple of seconds, that can completely transform your business in terms of what you can do. Microsoft, to give another example, they used to bring out products once every couple of years. That would mean we'd have years to plan for a launch event or whatever. For Azure, their cloud platform now, they release 85,000 times per day. That's how efficient their development process is. Now, the changes are smaller, right? They don't plan to do as much in each release but their agility in terms of what they can release has dramatically improved. So it means from a business perspective that it's completely changed how everyone in Microsoft works. We no longer have years to plan because we don't necessarily know what's going to be in these releases. And we have to be completely agile in the tech industry to keep up with that level of change. Augmentation is different because augmentation is about the idea that you're not just creating efficiencies or making things faster or speeding up your time of market. But you're also thinking about how you can actually make people's jobs better, how you can allow them to do new things perhaps faster. Sometimes with the automation discussion, it brings us very quickly, someone mentioned it here earlier, about the idea of actually replacing workers or replacing pieces of work. And that can be quite a challenge because when we think about, for example, artificial intelligence, depending on how you define it, as I, for those of you who were in the audience earlier today, Daniel made the distinction between things that call themselves artificial intelligence and things that are artificial intelligence. But let's look at the broader industry definition at the moment. There's a lot of technologies out there that are actually being sold on the basis of being able to replace workers. They literally have ROI spreadsheets for robotic process automation vendors where they have a little corner field that says how many people will you save, which how many roles will you actually be able to be made redundant as a result of using this technology. Now I find that shocking. In, in the AI world, a lot of the discussion has moved from this idea that AI will you know, displace roles to the fact that more roles will be created than destroyed. But fundamentally, there is going to be a huge shift in the people and what they do. And it's not necessarily the case that the same people whose jobs are going to be displaced are going to get the new roles that are going to be created. So no matter what way you look at it, 
there's going to be a huge learning requirement for the whole world as we transform due to automation or even augmentation. So I love the story of an AI, the first AI that was actually passed by the FDA in the US that allows you to actually diagnose a disease by looking at your iris, basically allows you to diagnose, and I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna try and get this right, diabetic retinopathy. It's a disease, diabetes related disease that's, that's associated, uh, uh, or an eye disease that's associated with diabetes. And for years, only a very few number of people were allowed to test for it. But now, there is an FDA approved diagnostic machine that allows anyone, regardless of whether they have a speciality kind of a specialist qualification to test for this. Amazing. Something that was only available to a couple of tens of thousands of people is now available through any health professional in the world. Can you imagine what that would do? And then can you imagine who's going to roll that out? Who's going to train all the medical professionals to use this new tool? Like there's huge learning and development challenges as we think about how we augment new roles. And then the idea that huge new industries are being invented. You know, not to mind the fact that roles are being invented. And you as a community of learning and development people have to magically decide what the learning plan is for the next few years when we don't even know what industries are going to be there, what roles are going to be needed. It's a tough challenge, so good luck to you. But, uh, but I'm, I have faith in you all. Um, but these, these are the kind of learning and development challenges that I think are there with digital transformation. And of course, the big problem in the room is that even when we think about all this potential, so many digital transformation projects fail. So there's, art, you know, there's various reports giving various different numbers. This is one of the latest ones out. 78% of enterprises say they don't get value from the digital transformation office, uh, um, initiatives from the Everest group. But you know, all the various big analysts would say a lot of them fail. So we have to look at why. Why do digital transformation projects fail? Well, I think there are kind of three main factors. The first is sometimes you've built the wrong thing. It's, it's to do with the fact that it's buggy, it's got security flaws, it was built on the wrong technology, you, you kind of decided to build the wrong thing and like you started, it was a five year project, you started in year one, by the time you got to year two, someone else was building it out there and offering it for much less. You know, I've, had, I've seen examples where people uh, had a problem in the business and five separate teams not knowing each other, all decided to build the solution to the problem and then they had an integration issue because they're all doing it slightly differently. So there's loads of problems around technical problems that require technical learning and development that we need to solve in the world to get the potential out of digital transformation. But I don't even think that's the biggest problem. Back to my earlier discussion. Even if you build the most beautiful technical solution in the world, a bigger problem is that oftentimes people don't want to use it that people don't think about the adoption plan, they don't think about who is going to be the end user, and they don't realize until way too late that they will be blocked in their ability to roll out these digital transformations by these individuals. Not by any you know, bad meaning, but just because they haven't thought about the actual rollout plan, or they think about it you know, a month to go and they contact you guys. I mean, you, has anyone ever had that situation? We've got a new technology coming out, we need a learning plan quick, pronto, we've got to tell you. Um, I certainly know that it has happened in many organizations I was looking at. Um, but the problem here is that very often even the training doesn't work, right? And, and people, and then in the tech industry, people are going, it's just not logical. I don't understand why they don't use my beautiful technology. And like, it can be very small. I was in one rollout of a collaboration tool where they were shifting, actually. This was, this was not a transformation in the sense of bringing new technologies. They're shifting from one tool set to a different tool set. And they had the whole thing planned. It was one of the biggest deals I was involved in Microsoft. Um, everything was good to go. And then there was a huge uprising, a revolt from the end users going, it doesn't do my calendars in the right color. So we're just not using this anymore. And you're kind of thinking, OK, I wasn't expecting that one. But the point is, it's very hard to understand why users will, will maybe react differently. And I think there's something other than just a lack, a lack of skills that's involved here. I think the big thing in the room that no one's actually discussing is that a lot of this digital transformation actually induces fear. And we, as an industry, all of us, are not addressing that. 
Now, I had, I had some suspicions about this, you know? You know when you get this kind of defensive reaction from some people when you start talking about change, and you're kind of thinking, why are you being so defensive? I mean, really, isn't this the good for the good of all of us? But actually, I think that there's actually a kind of a subconscious thing that's going on for people, that even if they think they want change, they're fearful of it. And some of the actual thinking behind this became much clearer to me. As soon as I left Microsoft, I decided to do a coaching diploma because I'd had really great experiences of coaching in Microsoft, and I thought it would be wonderful to learn more about it. And during that course, I came across this model by David Rock. David Rock is, um, uh, r runs the Neuro Leadership Institute. And he came across this, or he, he developed this model in 2008 called the SCARF model. And the whole idea behind the SCARF model is that there are social, he, he suggests that there are social threats that actually make us react in the same way as physical threats. So you guys would always know about the fight, flight, or freeze response when we're physically threatened, right? Where the lizard brain kicks in and we're flooded by adrenaline and cortisol and we, we, we react as if we're being threatened back from the, how we've evolved from our caveman days, cave person days, I guess. But we, we have actually evolved with this am amazing ability for this lizard brain to essentially hijack our brain so that we do things when we perceive a threat. His suggestion is that actually social threats can cause the same reaction as a physical threat. Now let's look at his model. Status, certainty, people's feelings of their status, their feelings of certainty, their feelings of autonomy, their feelings of relatedness or their relationships with other people and their feelings of fairness. I remember looking at this list for the first time and saying, oh, every single digital transformation project I have ever done We've been threatening these things. Like you're talking to someone and you're telling them, so we've decided to transform your whole business. You know, yes, this new tool is here. You've never seen it before. Let me tell you, it's going to be brilliant. It's going to do all these things that you used to do. You no longer have to talk to Joe in accounting because that's all going to be an automated. You don't need a relationship there anymore. You know, and, and actually we're going to make three people on your team redundant because we're so efficient these days, but we're going to have new resources over here in this other part of the business which is involved in innovation. And you're kind of thinking, you are literally designing this project to trigger all of these scarf responses. And then we wonder why people are like, oh, I don't know about that, oh, Genie Mac, that's all a bit fast for me. Because people are actually responding as if they have been physically threatened. And unless we start addressing that fact, even in terms of when we think about learning and development, that people are actually responding in a way, and by the way, when you're, um, when your lizard brain gets triggered and you have this what's called the amygdala hijack, it's been proven that your ability to have rational thoughts and to be able to think rationally can be impeded not just for minutes, but often hours after you're triggered. If you're constantly reminded of all these things, you could be in a state of not being able to make any rational decisions for, you know, ever, <laughs> I guess, depending on how long you stay in this state. So it's incredibly important that we think about how to actually move people away from this threat response it can be used in the positive too, though, because if you actually decide to increase people's feelings or their own perception of their status or their certainty or their autonomy or their relationships or fairness, then you can actually get them to, it, what actually gets released is dopamine, which actually makes everyone feel lovely and motivated and lovey, dovey towards you and your technology solution and all the rest of it, and it can be really, really positive. So I think that this idea is something that, particularly from a learning and development perspective, has to be thought of when we think about people's motivations. And so I'm just going to talk about three things that I've seen emerging from the tech area, from the tech communities, that might be interesting for you in terms of how to do this. The first is an example. So I mentioned robotic process automation earlier. And as I said, I've seen people actually respond so negatively to that that I remember one small company had built this amazing chatbot, actually, and really fantastic chatbot. And they, they, came, you know, they came to the company and went, we've got this amazing chatbot. It's going to completely make your, your sales engagements completely more efficient. It's going to up your customer engagement. It's going to allow you to work out of hours, all the rest of it. It caused an industrial relations re issue. Basically, the, the unions were called in and nothing was allowed to be deployed, and HR got involved. And the whole thing, which is a very small little experiment, caused this huge big HR issue that was a real disaster for them and stopped all RPA development from there on in that organization. Another case, the opposite approach, is one that I heard from a healthcare company in Ireland, where the IT manager had decided that he wanted to try out robotic process automation. 
But instead of actually prioritizing for efficiency, he decided to go out and find out the things that annoyed his employee, the employees in the business most. So he surveyed everyone and said, what do you hate? You know, when the interns come in, what do you give them because you hate doing it? What are the things that really annoy you the most? And he got a list and he prioritized on how much it annoys them. And he started rolling out RPA processes to actually deal with the things that annoyed them. And suddenly he was the hero and they loved it. And all of a sudden for them, digital transformation meant something meaningful. It meant something happy. It meant something that actually turned their fear response to, give me more of that stuff. Because it actually meant that their lives, they were emotionally positively impacted. The second thing for me is this idea of safe to fail experiments. We for so long have been living in a, in a world where project plans, where everything has been very well defined. But as we move to the fourth industrial revolution, where we have no idea really what these industries are going to look like, what the connections are going to be, the actors playing. You know, for me, I, I worked in Microsoft. Amazon came from left field. I was there when they said, Amazon, cloud service. <laughs> They're a bookseller. You know, <laughs> what are they going to do in the cloud world? They completely turned around our industry as they turned around book publishing, as they turned around retail. I hear they're getting pharmaceutical licenses. I'd watch out pharma. But the point is, you don't know where your competitors are coming from these days. They can be small companies. They can be big, but not in your field. All of this is, it creates uncertainty. And in uncertainty, we don't know what the answer is. So we have to leave room for experiments. And we have to encourage people to think that failure is not a bad thing. You learn from failure. We all know this. You all know this, right? You all know that children learn because they fail, they try, they try again, and as they go on, they get better. But we don't leave room for that in work. If you fail, you get your head chopped off, and it's considered a bad thing. But I think that we need to get more into doing these safe-to-fail experiments so people can understand how to experiment in this new world, have emergent practices, and actually share them quicker with their peers. Which brings me to the last one, communities of practice. Not a particularly new idea, but gaining, gaining a lot of momentum in the tech world. This idea that people can come together with a shared domain and come together as a community and share best practices, share anti-patterns, learn about what's new themselves, learn about what's happening in the industry. This is the idea of a decentralized learning kind of environment. Not to replace formal learning programs, but to enhance them. This kind of initiative where people actually self-motivate to go and do this sort of thing can often help you identify the leaders in your organization before you yourself have done it. Because these are the people who are really good at bringing together communities, collaborating, and helping people work together. And I think the idea of communities of practice is something that I think we should all be thinking of, encouraging so that people have this sense of safety and a safe place to go to talk about their problems and to learn more quickly. So I've, I've included, I know the slides will be, I think, um, distributed later, and I've included more details about how to find more, out more about these sort of ideas. Um, but there's some of my ideas anyway from the tech world, which I really think will help move people towards a place of more positive influences on the scarf idea, um, and hopefully help us all transition to a much better uh, world. Because as it happens, technology is just a tool, right? I mean, it's people who transform. So when we think about technology transformation, it's not the technology that's transforming, it's the people. So if you want to think about the skills and competencies that are going to make you successful in that area, they're not tech skills, they're transforming skills. So we need to all think more about that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Okay, uh, just out of blind curiosity, um, quick show of hands in the room. Don't worry, I'm not going to run this time, I'm knackered. Um, how many of you have challenges with adoption of digital strategies in your workplace for L&D? How many of you have an adoption strategy where you talk to the people to try and work out why they're not adopting it? Skin. Okay, cool. Right, up next we have Dante and we're going to do some questions at the end. So Dante is an e-learning comms and engagement specialist who has worked across the UK, the US, and the Middle East. Beginning in academia as an advocate for professional development with his fellow lecturers, he then recruited um, into learning and development in the private sector, and these are his words, lured overseas. As an American-Canadian Welsh mutt, again, his words, I'm not going to in trouble here, um, he feels well-placed to embrace the chaotic and thrilling times in which we live. So we give you Dante. Hello. Oh yeah, hello. So uh, I'm, 
as of two days ago, I'm uh, now the diversity and inclusion partner at GTR. I'm just saying that because it's clashing with what, it's, what uh, uh, Hannah just said. So um, what I'm here to tell you to talk about is, and it's been really useful to hear everything that Claire was sort of setting up in terms of the way we look at what digital transformation means kind of in, um, in, a, in a sort of macro level and how it actually is very micro in every way we go. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about kind of a, almost like a case study of a situation where in a particular organization in a partic particular industry where uh, digital transformation is in progress, but uh, via digital learning, we sort of found a way to actually have a kind of cultural transformation, which was, um, almost a, um, a happy and unexpected outcome. So I work for GTR, some of you may have heard of us, some of you may hate us, because a lot of people do. We're a Govia Thameslink Railway, and I say that as a joke, but uh, because there, you know, we are, it's, it's important I think to acknowledge that as an organization, we went, we've gone through some difficult periods, yeah? Um, and we've uh, been in the news quite a bit, partially because when I joined the organization in 2016, we were at the very beginning of a massive industrial relations, one of the longest industrial relations conflicts in the country. Um, that happily has been resolved for us, but it's causing issues about the same issues in other places. Um, and then we were all part of the, you know, the sort of across the country, the nationwide timetable mess that happened in 2018. Uh, and we are fortunate to be one of the few people, that, for few organizations that has come out of that and found ourselves in a place where we're actually uh, now performing better than we ever have. And a lot of that was about learning from the mistakes that were made and also about um, going to our people. I think in some ways we really had, uh, we, we benefited from the difficulty that was in place when we started launching our, our e-learning because we were in the midst of this industrial relations issue and we were very keenly aware that our, our population was extremely disengaged and that the only way we were going to make any progress was to really go to them directly and find out what it was that was going to make this experience work. So um, we're the largest talk in the uh, training operating, train operating com com company in the country. We're made up of these four different brands. And we initially sat down with our, our uh, partner, we partnered with an organization called Calidus, which is a software and e-learning uh, supplier and developer who you have a presence downstairs. I encourage you to go and chat with them and have a smoothie because they have a little smoothie bar. Um, and they were really brilliant for us because it was all about, it became very clear that we were going to be a difficult customer because we were going through these issues. We weren't going to be following probably the standard process um, and we had a lot of uh, internal issues. And I'll talk about more of the kind of the uptake later, but initially when I joined the organization um, in 2016, 80% of our population, 7,300 roughly uh, employees, 80% of them did not use their email address. They did not use it, they weren't aware if they had it, even if they were aware that they had it, they didn't want to talk about it. Um, sometimes we'd have you know, platform stations, platform staff that would share an, uh, an, an email address. They were not really interested. And things were, we were going again through this difficult time and we had to figure out a way because we were required by the, um, by the DFT, the D Department for Transportation, to deliver on this customer service development program. So we're not talking in this case about, you know, tickets, ticketing processes, procedures, you know, operations. We're talking about a behavioral development program that we had to deliver in a blended learning environment. And the reason that was blended learning was so important was A, because uh, we were at a place where we believed that the organization needed to make that leap, because we had pretty much been all talk and chalk up until that point. And also because we struggled a lot with release of our front line to be able to go to a classroom for the day. We got as many people through that process as we could, and then we reached a, a, a limit and that was about a third of the way the people that we were required to do this training. So it became very clear that we had to focus s pretty much aggressively on the online learning. And again, with a population that 80% of which didn't want to look at their email and didn't really, they had devices, they had phones that were rubbish that didn't really work very well. Um, and if they had a device or an iPad, it usually was sitting in a drawer or in a locker and that was about the extent of it. So we found, you know, up ultimately what we created with Calidus in partnership, and this was all about sort of the relationship that we developed over time, was this uh, blended learning where they have a classroom experience, and then they would go to these six or seven modules and a couple of games. It was all very um, uh, gamified and animated purely because of bandwidth, because our internal technology was in such a uh, bad state. There we go. Whoops. Um, 
And it was, so it was, face, it was focused on this animated storytelling that was very scenario-based in order to get to where we needed to go. And again, quickly we learned, actually, the classroom is probably not going to work very well. We're going to need to make the shift almost entirely to on, online learning. Um, fortunately, they were with us through that whole process. And throughout the process, we knew that if we were going to re-engage this very disengaged population, they had to be a part of the process. They had to be part of what got us to where we needed to go. We knew that it had to be in little learning bites so that people working on a platform could say, instead of saying, we're going to take you out of the, off your job for the day or for half a day, we're going to pull you aside for 10 minutes. You go over there, you do a couple of learning bites on your phone. We got new devices, and that would allow them to move through the material uh, at their own pace. And it was a way that the managers were able to actually engage their staff in a way that was sort of, uh, that wasn't sort of scary. You know, Claire talks a lot about that fear factor. I can fully embrace that idea. We are dealing with every day with a population that is not tech savvy, as for the most part. Most of them, most of our employees, you know, uh, look like me. They're sort of middle-aged white guys. Um, a lot of them are not um, comfortable or interested in using any kind of technology in their workplace. Now, what they do at home is different, but in terms of their work experience, uh, they had to really be convinced. So, we roll out this product, and we find over time that there's a change. I'm going to talk more about how that change happened, but I think it's important to look at what the results are. Starting with this, 100% of our customer-facing staff went through the program. We saw a marked difference in the number of customer complaints about customer service. So we're talking about a behavioral development shift, behavioral shift from an online learning platform. This is something that had never been done before in our neck of the woods, certainly. We saw praise of customer praise raising. We saw general, the services developing better and better and performing better and better. And uh, on the National Rail Passenger Survey scores, we thought, saw ourselves going up and up and up in all sort of key areas. And the most important thing we saw over the time that we were with these two, uh, we, we, the two years that we were developing this learning program, was this uptick in employee engagement. Our rates went up 24%, which is extraordinary. I mean, for, a, for our organization, last, the last employee survey that we did, uh, we had an 85% uh, response rate, which is almost unheard of in the rail industry, let alone other industries. Um, but I think the other thing, again, is going back to what we talked about before, which is by 2019, 90% of our staff signed on to our online platform for, uh, for uh, uh, rewards and recognition which required them to interact with a new portal, to know what their email address was, to know what their password was, and to actually engage with a piece of, of, of technology that was foreign to them. 90%. And that comes from that 80% of staff not even knowing about their email address. And now, today, we're constantly looking at new ways to use online learning uh, to interact with it. We have new ticket training. We have new uh, mental health training. We have new all kinds of other training areas that are rolling out on our online platform, and we're not, we, we're not have reaching, we're not experiencing any of the sort of uh, disengagement and difficulties that we did in the beginning, because something has really changed. And this is, and I mean, I'm sure you've all seen this quote many times, but this has really been, for us, you know, customer service is, is difficult to quantify in a lot of times, the scores on customer service, because there are a lot of different things that will impact how a customer feels about the product, particularly when you're talking about uh, train service. One of those is, does the train come on time? That's very important. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but that in our business, that's very important to us. Um, but there are a lot of other things that might come into play. So we believe definitely that this, this program, One Step Ahead, that we rolled out, had an, an, a significant impact on those scores. But what really changed, and what we can quantify, and what I am actually more interested in talking to you about today and hearing from you about, is the fact that our business went from an organization where people didn't like technology, people weren't interested in doing online learning, people had a phone that they hated and or just didn't care to bother with, to an organization where basically 90% of our people are now interacting in a way with technology and learning that is foreign to them but more comfortable and continues to be more comfortable every day. And this means that there's all sorts of other things that we're able to reach them about that we weren't able to reach them about before. In the past, if we wanted to, when I was internal comms, if we wanted to connect with our, you know, our front line, you had to sort of send 
Basically, you'd email a, a, a poster template to all these different locations. They would print out the poster, and they would put it up in the mess room or in their, on their notice boards, and that's how you communicated with the front line. Today, we have 90% of our folks, you can actually send them an email and they'll get it. Now, it's not overnight. We're still in the middle of what we call destination digital. There's still a process happening, but we've seen a massive shift. And when I go out to stations and I talk to people about, you know, how's it going? What are you interested in? Was this working for you? What would you like to see differently? What kind of learning would you like to experience in this way? They're actually happy to talk to me about it. And uh, I can tell you, I had many days where I went out in the very beginning of this program where that was not the case. That was not the case. They were more interested in talking about more operational things. Fair enough. Well, for now, this, from them, this has now become just part of their regular operations, their business as usual. So that's kind of my spiel in terms of what our shift is, our change was uh, at a high level. I'm really interested to hear from you and talk to you about how that actually happened. You know, a lot of it came down to uh, getting the line managers, who are our most important asset in terms of communication and engagement, getting them um, really on board, getting them comfortable with the material. But it also really came down to us looking at just exactly what Claire was talking about, which is um, this is not about uh, a new technology. It's not about a new tool. It's about people. It's about getting people to embrace this tool. It's about addressing what they're afraid of, what their concerns are, and fixing the problems that they're facing every day that should be easy to fix, but for whatever reason, we've been failing up until this point. So that's kind of my spiel, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite Claire and Dante up onto the stage. I'm going to move amongst you all, like challenge Annika. Um, if you've got any questions for Claire and Dante, please wave enthusiastically at myself, and I'll come over with the microphone. I love the enthusiasm already. Small sprint. Uh, this is to Dante. Firstly, thank you for, for sharing the success story. It's great to hear. Um, You've used this for a behavioral change and you've seen great success as a result. Has the organization looked at taking a similar approach for more technical or process-driven training? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what, we're for, what I'm happy about too is in terms of what, what our success was with One Step Ahead is that suddenly we had you know, the ticketing people come to us and say, oh, who is that you got to do that e-learning with that, that, that One Step Ahead stuff? Because we need to get people, introduce them to a whole new Tom, Tom Tiss was this whole new ticketing process. And they're really resistant. And what we've done before, they're not really happy with. And how would we go about doing that? And then, and so that was the first thing that happened, and that changed immediately. There's a whole other rollout that's just happened recently about um, contactless ticketing, and, and now they're looking at um, mental health awareness training for our managers. So it's really expanded beyond that. At first, it was very much, not from our side, not from you know, my team, but from the business, it was very much a tick box exercise. There's a, there's a committed obligation, we have to do it, the DFT said that, we're gonna do that. But for us, it became really about, wow, this is having an effect on the way people are or how we can reach our people, and so it really has ballooned since then. Uh, who else was waving enthusiastically? Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I guess uh, my question is more about your internal teams, your L&D teams. Um, I think we've got a really good plan for our organisation. We've done a lot of focus groups out and there, and people are starting to get on board. I think we're having bigger struggles with our internal L&D team. Is that anything you faced? You mean convincing them that this was the way to go? Oh, absolutely, because you're talking about, you know, basically you're saying to folks, well, instead of you doing all the training, we're going to have, we're going to out, roll out some online learning, and then um, I'm not sure what you're going to do. But that is actually, it turned out to be not the case because uh, it freed them up. So instead of them being, you know, really bogged down with, um, not bogged down, they would, someone would, I'd be in trouble with, my boss was here hearing me say that, but them being sort of like stuck with the, some of the training that is much more uh, technical um, and not necessarily in their wheelhouse and is already being kind of managed by what we call vocational training that allows them, so instead of uh, spending a lot of time doing the, the, the same repeating thing over and over again because you're trying to reach this huge audience that's spread out all over the network, that you can, uh, right, we're going to do this e-learning, but we're still going to do these other, we're going to, you know, give you a chance to really focus on some of the things you'd like to do, but you don't have time to do because, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're putting you in a classroom with 10 people instead of 50 because that's, uh, that's we can only release 10 people. So it's, it's had a real effect. I mean, you're right, it took a minute for people to sort of get their head around it, but as soon as they saw that it wasn't replacing them, that it was sort of freeing them up to do 
all the other things they were trying to do, um, we sort of got them to buy into it. But I do think, I think it's a really important point, which is the L&D team has to be your ch main cheerleader, in a sense, for this material. They have to really embrace it and engage with it. Um, and, and because if they don't believe it, uh, it's gonna be hard to, to convince the line managers as well. Claire, do you have anything else with your teams and who you've worked with? Only to say that I think the the you know the ability to scale through the the kind of the system that you actually um, delivered. I mean that that is a prime example of the value of like digital transformation. So essentially, in your case, you had maybe two audiences that you were working with, like the actual L and D team itself, but then also the broader audience. So in the context of that, it's it's uh, I mean you, you you literally just case studied the points I was making in terms of actually you know the, the journey that they have to go through and how you have to be able to assuage their. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great example. I think just to really quick, one of the other things that I thought about when Claire was talking about her experience at Microsoft was that we were brought into Microsoft to talk to them about some of our products. And what I was really impressed by was the fact that, and I think this had a big uh, effect on how, what was effective for us and what wasn't, which is suddenly we had tech people that were talking about change management. Mm -hmm. They were talking about engagement. They weren't just talking about product and, um, whatever it is that tech people talk about, um, because <laughs> I'm not one of those people necessarily. They were really talking about how do we get people to, to embrace this? How do we get people to feel comfortable with it? What do people need from us to really, to get them to use our beautiful projects, that products that we produced that we're so proud of? Um, and, and that, I think, is a real step, a, ma a massive change in the way that, that, that technology is interacting with the audience. It's just what you said, Claire, it's about this, where it's more about service than it is about product. And, and you'll see in the tech industry a, a huge rise in the idea of customer success units. That, that, that didn't exist. Like That was a whole like uh, function that didn't exist maybe 10 years ago. And now every tech organization has it. And it's specifically like in that area. And uh, just to tie it back to a conversation that was happening in the Women in Learning event earlier, there was a question about kind of careers and stuff like that and, and, and opportunities for people in learning and development. I mean, you know, what you're starting to see now is that the, the kind of the skills that people with learning and development expertise have are much more required in other parts of the business who are interested in understanding the learning patterns of people and change management. So it's, it's kind of like your ability to actually put people and help people on a learning journey is broader than just a learning and development kind of um, set of competencies. And there's a huge opportunity in the broader set of communities, even if people don't have a learning and development or you know, part of the organization, that those skills become very important. Great. Um, oh, here we go. I'm going to run to the front and then I'm going to run to the back. Thank you both for sharing, particularly Dante, for sharing a, a concrete example with real end user statistics. <laughs> it's, it's rare that we get to see these things. Uh, you mentioned the SCARF model earlier. I'm a big fan of models because we can leverage what other people have done. And I was wondering, things like ADCAR, which we use for change, I think actually heightens fear. <laughs> it's part of the process. Uh, do you know of any change management models or transformation models out there that tend to focus on reducing the anxiety? I don't, and I'd love to hear them if people have them, because this is exactly what I'm trying to promote, actually, within people in tech, so that they start kind of understanding that. Like, I, you know, I, I actually get quite, you, you start reading things where people talk about motivating people through fear, and, you know, if you, if you look at anything around, you know, Daniel Pink's work around motivation or um, conscious leadership, there's all these kind of levels of motivation. If it's fear-based, you're, you're playing a losing game. Like, you're, like, that's never going to help us all, you know? But if you move it up into this idea of, helping people you know, think about a, a better end result. Somehow there has to be a way that we can create a vision for people of the future where it's a better place for them. And, and, and I think it's around the prioritization of the business to a certain degree, and then it's about how we work with people as well. But I, I, don't, I don't know of many models which incorporates that as a, except maybe coaching in general, like the, all the coaching models in some respects do think about well-being as, they, as you move through. So maybe there's more assets in that in that arena that we can take out and try and adapt to scale because actually and so that brings me back to the I saw the the presentation about chatbots for coaching um, yesterday it was the last session and that was amazing right because because there is this notion that you can't do that kind of activity without humans being in the loop but of course you can because it turns out humans respond just as well to questions whether or not they're asked by a bot or a person because they just love to talk so sometimes maybe it's just giving a scaled ability for people to engage in a way that maybe that's and, and looking at some of the coaching models that have been there for generations and thinking how do we put them into 
our learning programs in some way, because maybe maybe that's the answer. Perfect. Right, I'm running back round again. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say a big thank you um, to both of you, but and I'm highly appreciated that we had actually a woman here talking about digital transformation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, especially uh, after just being into women and learning um, and, and the regards to digital and technology, we said uh, that women are very often uh, underrepresented or uh, not represented at all also at this conference. So really very much appreciated. Um, and then a question uh, instead to you uh, regarding uh, your communication. You said uh, first you were hanging up posters and uh, then uh, you could finally uh, reach the people uh, through their devices and that the uh, line managers were key. Uh, I fully agree that the line managers are key, but uh, what I didn't uh, really gr uh, get was um, how did you change your communication towards the line managers? What was really the trigger that made the big difference? I think part of it, there was a, there was a real aha moment uh, early on where we suddenly came to that recognition that it doesn't matter how many board execs you know, people in the in the executive stand up and say we're all behind this. We think it's great. I'm going to be your uh, you know executive sponsor. That's great, but uh, they're not going to be getting the platform person to do this online learning. It's not going to. There's no connection there. I mean, or there is a very abstract connection there. So for us, it was that moment of suddenly real. And and for uh, we as a small learning and development team, we're not going to make it happen either. Uh, the only person who ha the, the the layer that has that actual effect is that area of line management, and they are traditionally. And historically, certainly in our business, and I think in a lot of businesses, you know, uh, buried under work, buried under bureaucracy, tons of paperwork, pulled in ten different directions uh, on a good day, and uh, they ha don't get a great deal of support. So we sort of made it our point that this, this, the the learning that we rolled out, um, especially in the classroom, the the first part, they all attended the classroom event. They would also all attend a, another day that was just about. You're the, you know, you're going to be the one who's going to be. Su we're, we're supporting you to help you support your your clients, your 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 people, and so that shift was key to, to sort of letting them know that we recognize how important you are, and we need you, and we're going to do whatever we can to make this as easy for you as possible. But I would say too, at the same time, you know, we didn't stop doing to we don't stop putting up posters. We still do posters. We still do all of that. It's just we've broadened our portfolio of ways that we can reach people. And you know, some people we can reach on Yammer. They love going on Yammer, even you know, it doesn't matter what role they're in. Uh, so, uh, some people we can reach um, only by putting up something in the, uh, basically on the back side of the uh, the toilet door. That's the only way those people are going to look at that thing. So we found all these different ways to go about it. We just had to become much more savvy that people need different things. But those line managers are key. Thank you. Uh, can I just add into that? I, you just touched on a really interesting point that I think is often overlooked, and that is in the in the context of digital transformation. In many cases, like in some cases, there's a change from state A to state B, like n not digitized, digitized. But in many cases, particularly around customer experience, it's not a change. It's not like state A to state B. It's kind of like it was state A, now it's state B, C, A, B, C, and D, because we have to address people in different ways, but we still have to maintain the old way of doing things as well, because there's a huge demographic who are going to live longer who expect that. So it is an important fact when we think about dealing with people's fears of the future, that there's still, you know, where where it's relevant, and in a lot of places it is, particularly around customer experience or employee engagement and things like that, there's still, um, some people's roles will still be there, like, what, what you know, not changed, unchanged, and it is important to also understand that, uh, because that creates maybe a separate set of fears that you're kind of be left behind, but, it, but it's another area to make sure that people understand that sometimes a digital transformation doesn't mean shifting everything to a new way. It means we have to do things in multiple ways now. And that's sometimes hard for people as well, because it's, it's extra work. And, and sometimes that's never, you know, no one clocks that beforehand. And it's only afterwards that you realize you have to now maintain multiple channels of communication. So, you know, the printer's not all necessarily going, you know. Okay, any more questions? Oh, oh a second question. <laughs> extra enthusiasm, right. Uh, so, Dante, um, this is more of a logistics question. So one of the challenges that I have in my industry is a remote workforce and connectivity. Mm -hmm. So even though we're in a, a modern world, the people on the receiving end have very limited connectivity. 
Um, the deployment of this, you mentioned about mobile devices. Did you do it over handsets and phones, or did you do it through tablets and, and so on? And was it cellular or Wi-Fi? We, uh, we did it through both. So it was, it was a, a mixture of all those things. Because uh, like you, we have some stations where, I mean, their connectivity is just abysmal. It's shocking. I don't know how they get anything done, to be honest with you. Uh, and I really, it's to their credit that they're able to do that. Not, not as much now, I'll be honest with you. But we've had a shift in our sort of IT culture as well that's prioritize that happening. But um, it was a big part of our decision about how, how to connect. And Calidus was really useful in this way because they were very much about um, what is your situation? How can we make it better for you? And that was the animation. You know, some people, sometimes you might find somebody uh, uh, on the line who's not really thrilled with watching a bunch of what they call, you know, cartoons about how to do their job, but they're able to watch it. So, um, so it, was, it was mobile devices, it was tablets, uh, it was desktops. Some, in some places, the manager would literally just pull people in because their desktop worked. So they pull people in for 20 minutes to do the e-learning on a rotation, that sort of thing. But um, it did almost always come down to having some kind of connectivity because it wasn't really about, we didn't really have the capacity to, to have anybody sort of like download anything onto their device. They had to be able to be connect connected. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yes. Hi, yeah. Um, you both mentioned about sort of like a launch plan and um, kind of strategy for bringing in the new initiative, for like for example, like engaging line managers and communities of practice, for example. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about like the different sort of key milestones in that launch plan, like including those like engaging line managers, etc., communities of practice, and what else. Well, certainly from a communities of practice perspective, the most the ones that I have been um, aware of and involved in in terms of profiling, um, the vast majority of them are started by individuals and actually not necessarily initiatives from the organisation at all, which is why I think it's a great example of showing bottom up, you know, leadership really around around these sort of initiatives. Um, they're then often supported by the organisation and but let evolve, so they're not necessarily over controlled. So from a certainly from a um, communities of practice perspective, that's they're often more supported than necessarily planned and launched, in my experience, or the you know the most successful ones often are. Um, the the but from a from a technology rollout perspective, um, the ones that I have found are the most effective are ones that are actually are engaged in that rollout plan before a dot of work is done on the building of the product. And I think that that is a failing in an awful lot of major projects where they leave it as a kind of a rollout stage milestone. We're getting close to it now. Now we'll engage with people in terms of how that rolls. I mean, um, and that, that is still commonly done. Um, in fact, if, if even done at all, if, if, if it's not like we've just bought this technology, what are we going to do with it kind of scenario? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I suppose from my perspective, um, from a milestone perspective, the, the, the learning and development and adoption plan should start before any jot of work is done on buying the solution because you have to engage people in what they need and how, the, how, the, how they need it and address, because, uh, and this is back to decision-making processes, you have to be able to identify all the issues you're going to face before you design the actual solution. So to the point of, you know, some people may not even think about the offline or the low connectivity solution and then buy something and then realize afterwards that's a problem. That happens all the time. So, so I think that, that's the one comment I would make. It has to start first, actually. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with, and we learned, you know, um, like a lot of organizations or, or industries, real people, we, even though our, thing, our training was about behavior, if someone saw that train and they're like, well, that train doesn't have tables, that tra that's wrong. They're, then they're, you've lost them. I mean, it's, it's, and especially when you're at the beginning when we were talking about folks who are already very suspicious and really reluctant. So if you give them any reason to say, well, these people don't know what they're talking about, they'll turn away from that. So it was so key that this part of the, they were brought in from the very beginning. So we initially would, you know, once you got the sort of the exec buy-in, then it went immediately to sort of um, focus group groups uh, from out the, across the network, not not massive ones, not hundreds of them, just a few to sort of get feedback, and then a kind of few key people that every time a new module storyboard came out, that we could go to them and say, "Is there anything in here that we need to be worried about? Is there anything we're getting wrong? Is there anything that's going to?" And there were often things that we were getting wrong. And God bless them, the supply calendars. I mean, they you know they weren't real people. The guy I worked with, the main developer I worked with. Um, was he learned more about trains than he ever wanted to know. And he went out to stations and looked at things and talked to people because he knew that um, those little details were important. Um, and that you had to make people feel like you sort of recognize where they were and where they work and what's important to them. Because if you can't get the, 
whatever, the trains on, I mean, the t tables on the 700 trains, right, then you clearly don't really care about what they're doing. And so you have to get it right. Does that, make, is that answering the question, sort of? Yeah. But what's interesting is that actually talks to the relatedness. So when you actually, if you provide learning that makes people feel like they have been consulted and, and they hear their own voice in that, it, it, it literally, it triggers that ligger, the lizard brain and makes them feel they love me. I, l I love it, you know, and there's all the love. So that's, that's a, a really good example of that. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, any more questions? Oh, there's one behind me. Hi, uh, so I'm, I'm on the NHS table. I work for the NHS in the, in the northeast of England. Um, and I'm sat here sort of internally, frantically nodding at everything you're both saying. Because um, we do, I mean, we're a massive organisation. We're about 15,000 staff strong, um, sp you know, spread across the whole of Newcastle. Um, but we're a relatively small L&D team. I'm one of two people that works on the technology enhanced learning team. Um, and we do. We have exactly what Claire was saying. We we've got that element of fear of change. You know, it's a it's it's a. I mean, I don't know if the if the other ladies agree, but we've we've got this element of fear in the organisation. You know, we we if you always do it the way you've always done, it's safe. You know, and and you know, bless me and Steve are desperately trying to sort of change that. Um, we have really really similar problems to exactly what Dante was saying there. You know, we've got we've got staff who who either through capability or ability during the working day can't access their emails they maybe don't know how to use the the um the, the system they can't be released you know we've got frontline medical staff and clinical staff who can't be released to come to classroom sessions so we've got big issues with compliance and you know staff development um so this is what we're looking to try and change <laughs> me and this one other person um so from a really pragmatic point of view where do I start? I think. I mean, I think to be fair, the the good thing, the the good news is, um, uh, it's you can do it. It can happen, uh, and it can you can it can digital transformation can. Um, people are doing it all across the the globe, uh, to varying degrees of success. It's, it's certainly it's a it's an ongoing process. But I think I mean. I, I, for, for us, what worked was we found uh, suppliers who we could partner with who were keen to sort of figure out, to get to know us, to understand what our unique problems were, and we were, we're willing to have a conversation, and we're willing to, you know, because I remember sitting down in a very early meeting and saying, we're not that kind of client, I'm sorry. We're not going to follow that. We can't follow this, this project management uh, plan because we're a mess, and, you know, people are, the trains are not running on time, and things are, stri people are striking, and we, we can't do it. And they were uh, able to, uh, to react to that. And uh, so I think it's really important, first of all, to find the right kind of relationship with the right kind of supplier. And in terms of the broader picture, I think the, um, the, the, you have to spread the love. You gotta make sure that it's not all falling on your shoulders, that, you are, that other people are accountable all across the business, because it is, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a change that's going to benefit everyone. Um, you know, we went to visit the TFL, the, uh, Transport for London, the underground people, and they had gotten, they were a previous client of Calidus's, and they had a team of like, I think initially 200, and then it was down to uh, maybe like 40. And again, and I was very similar, it was me and my coworker, we were doing it. And we just thought, oh my God, this is no way, we're never gonna be able to do this. But we did, because it became, we made it, the, it became about an engagement process, which became about the people process, which it became about, you know, uh, this sort of digital adoption process, which became about what the, what GTR was created to do, which was deliver on this Thameslink program, which is all about change. And so it, we, we sort of, w it had to be spread across the whole industry to make people understand that, you know, um, if this is gonna work, we all have to embrace it. Because um, the, the front line is gonna be the front line and they're gonna react the way they react and we have to be there to help them. Um, and there's only, you know, so many hours in the day. So I, I would like to echo that. I mean, I think the partners that you work with are the people that like potentially scale what, what you're doing and, and help you in, in that respect. I'd also um, point out the, the, the idea of safe-to-fail experiments um, uh, came, for, I, 
was recently introduced to the, this idea of, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Kinevin framework by Dave Snowden. Um, it's around working in complex systems. It's about working when you don't know the end result and you're not really sure about how to proceed. And I feel it, it's very um, applicable for this new world we're moving into. Um, interestingly, Dave Snowden has done an awful lot of work with the NHS in Wales, actually, and using a lot of those approaches. Um, and he talks about how to actually formulate experiments um, and, and even involve people in new ways by having these kind of triads of communication between someone on the learning team, someone on the technology team, some patient, you know, the, you know, the idea of, of actually how you would construct a series of experiments that would allow you to figure out what might work and then amplify them like hell. Like, and, you know, so, so the whole idea there is that you don't make this grand plan and then go, oh my God, how am I going to even start? But that you do think, well, what are the small experiments I can make? Oh, I see that one's working. Right, let's let's put a little bit more resource on that. And um, so I would definitely, I, I included the link in the end of my presentation, but I would definitely take a look at that. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of the time. And um, in all my years of chairing, I don't think I've had so many questions at the end of a session, which says a lot about Dante and Claire's presentations and you guys as an audience. So I think we can reward ourselves with tea and bickies. And thank you again, Dante and Claire. Thank you.